The Conservative Political Action Conference held its annual meeting this week and, if you can believe it, a presidential straw poll for 2016. Here are the results. Tea Party favorite Kentucky Senator Rand Paul won with 25 percent. Senator Marco Rubio was a close second at 23, and former presidential candidate Rick Santorum a distant third at 8 percent. The CPAC meeting highlighted the disagreement over the best way for the party to broaden its base. Matt Kibbe is president of FreedomWorks, a leader of the Tea Party movement. Former Congressman Steve La Tourette is head of the Republican Main Street Partnership. And gentlemen, welcome to Fox News Sunday. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Uh, Congressman La Tourette, during the lame duck session in December, you talked about the 40 to 50 chuckleheads, right. your phrase in the House, who are blocking Senator, or rather Speaker Boehner from making a budget deal with the president. What is it about the Tea Party freshmen that make them chuckleheads? Well, I don't think I, I would say that it's all the Tea Party freshmen. It's this 40 or 50 in the 112th Congress that seemed more interested in voting no and going home than governing. And, and that comment was made after Plan B. And you have to recognize And that Plan B was to just raise taxes on people making over a million dollars. Yeah, and it was the opening gambit. And it would have given the Speaker the opportunity to go to the White House and over to the Senate and say, here, I have a package, uh, and now let's continue our negotiations. When you take it down, as the Speaker said in our meeting after that, you send him to the White House naked. He's got no armor. He's got no tools. Well, looking forward, Mr. Kibbe, what is it about uh, the Tea Party and its views on spending and taxes that members of the Republican establishment, like Congressman La Tourette, don't get? Well, you have to take a step back and understand the only reason we're talking about a balanced budget, the only reason that we're having a serious debate about 16 plus trillion in debt is because of the Tea Party class from 2010 and, and the, the, the folks we added in 2012. You have to stop this process, this, this bipartisan process of just kicking the can down the road, creating these, these artificial crises on New Year's Eve and say, let's put some ideas on the table. Let's stop playing this game. And that's what we have done. And we're never going to fix this problem just by, by pretending that, that the process of bipartisanship somehow gets to real problems, because that's how we got here. This, this crisis was created by both Republicans and Democrats not willing to make tough choices. Well, I'll tell you, that, that flies in the face of what we did in the 1990s. Uh, Bill Clinton was the president. John Kasich was the budget chair. Newt Gingrich was the speaker. And we created the Balanced Budget Act of 1997. And quite frankly, it was during the Bush years uh, of spending, multiplied now by the Obama years, that, that we have this mess. And at the end of the day, my difficulty with the Tea Party freshmen isn't that they, the true passion that they bring to this. They're an important part of the Republican Party. My difficulty is at the end of the day, you have to govern. Just saying no uh, doesn't get you anything. And that it creates these false crises. You, you can get past the false crises if you can work something out. And it doesn't mean surrendering principle. It doesn't mean becoming a Democrat or a rhino or a dino. It means working together in a way that you get 60% of what you want. Well, you got to go back because I, I don't think the Tea Party has created the budget crisis. We came in with our members and, and tried to do something about it. I remember a day when when April 15th is when the House and Senate had to pass a budget resolution. I remember when they had to, to reconcile the 13 appropriations bills. I remember a day when the president actually had to introduce his budget. And today we don't do any of that stuff. And that, that's how we got to the 16 trillion. And there is something rational about, about standing on the tracks and saying, you know what, we can't do it this way anymore. We have to do it some other way. Listen, if, if, that, was, if that, that was the way these guys were operating, I'd be all, all for that. But for instance, we couldn't even get, I was, on, I was an appropriator, we couldn't get our Labor, Health, and Human Services bill, the biggest of the bills besides defense, out because three of our members wouldn't support the chairman's mark. Now, that's not, that's not trying to solve the problem and move forward. Don't get too in the here. Sorry, but I'm telling you, you, you can't get it done. And, and just voting no and then holding your nose and say, boy, if it passes, then I can go home to my local Tea Party groups and say, I voted no. That's ridiculous. That's what makes them chuckleheads. Let me switch to another subject, Mr. Kibbe. Uh, one of the recent splits in the party, uh, and we saw it in the last week, has been over national security. You backed uh, Rand Paul's filibuster of the president's drone policy in the Senate. Uh, you also backed the sequester of across-the-board cuts, even in the Pentagon. But isn't one of the GOP's strengths with the American people that it's tough on national security? Well, you could be fiscally responsible and tough on national security. I think it, it would well, be... Well, the drone has nothing to do with... with 
fiscal issues. That's a, that's a question. Certainly. So, so there's two issues here. One is, one is about basic civil liberties. And I think, I think the new GOP, reflected by, by Rand Paul's willingness to challenge the status quo in both the Republican and Democratic parties, that's a healthy thing. And young people in particular, they're looking for, for leadership that, that's willing to challenge the idea that, that government's always right. I'm, I think that's where we are as well. But on defense, on, on any, frankly, any budget, any program, any department of the federal government, let's all acknowledge that there is waste and things that need to be eliminated. And a trimming of defense would be a very healthy thing. And you, can't, you have to put everything on the table. You can't say that this sacred cow cannot be touched. I think the GOP has made that mistake. Congressman La Tourette, uh, Rand Paul, in his speech at CPAC, talked about defense hawks like John McCain and Lindsey Graham as, as stale and moss-covered. Uh, there is a war weariness in the country. Should the Republican Party, in its tr uh, uh, trying to grow the party and appeal to new voters, should it be pulling back on national defense? Well, you know, I grew up in the era of the $800 hammer and the $600 toilet seat, so yeah, there are efficiencies there. But if you're looking for the con to the Constitution for something that the government's actually supposed to be involved in, it is defending the country. And the sequestration was the most ham-handed way of, of dealing with things, and we only got there because of the dysfunction that exists, because the Democrats won't give an inch, uh, and, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's incumbent upon us to find that sweet spot. Boehner tried to do it with the president. The president isn't willing, but we got to find that sweet spot. That includes the Pentagon. Well, you, you said dysfunction, and you kind of motioned in Mr. Kibbe's direction. Do you think the Tea Party is, is adding to the dysfunction in Washington? No, not at all. Uh, I think the Tea Party is an important part of the coalition that is the Republican Party. What my difficulty with, not necessarily Mr. Kibbe's group, but other groups like his, is that there's some now, now some kind of litmus test that what makes a good Republican or a bad Republican. And the reason that we don't have a Republican president today, in my opinion, is that we don't represent the whole country. We don't have one member of Congress who's a Republican from the entire eastern seacoast till you get down to the, uh, the Carolinas and Virginia. Uh, you, you can't govern the country unless you look like the country. Uh, and so I, I think they're an important part of the coalition, but they are not the Republican Party. They're part of the Republican Party. And how do you respond to that? That, that in a sense, you've, you may have energized the party, but you've also narrowed it. Oh, I don't think so. If you, if you look at CPAC, you look at the rock stars of the GOP, the next generation, the people that, that we're excited about, these are Tea Party freshmen. Rand Paul, uh, Ron Johnson from a very purple, maybe blue state, uh, Pat Wisconsin. Toomey, Pat Toomey from Pennsylvania, and of course Marco Rubio. We've brought diversity, we've brought energy, and most important, I think we've brought ideas because we're colorblind about all of this stuff. But if you want to come to the Senate, come to the Congress, and offer a plan to balance the budget, we're going to support you. Put your ideas on the table. That's what's lacking in this whole debate. Well, I, I got to say that, that, sadly, what they've also brought us is Harry Reid as the majority leader continuing in the Senate. If you look at uh, the Nevada race, Sharon Engel, if you look at Richard Murdoch in Indiana, if you look at the, and I always forget her name, the witch in Delaware. Christine O'Donnell. Thank you. Uh, you <laughs> we could have functional control of the United States Senate today, but for this litmus test that exists today. There were a lot of establishment candidates, Republican candidates, who went down in this last election, too. Yeah, but went down, went down in, from the standpoint that they lost to Democrats, unlike some of these, Mr. Murdoch, for instance. I mean, we're supposed to wonder. Richard Murdoch, Indiana. Indiana. Why we don't have the women's vote in this country when we have a candidate suggesting that a child born as a result of, uh, of rape is a gift from God? I, I'm not wondering why we don't have more women voting for Republicans. Well, let me ask you about that, and that's the last thing we're going to get into here. Carl Rove, and he's going to be on the panel, has started something called the Conservative Victory Project to try to get into the primaries to make sure that there are more electable Republicans, people that can win the primaries that can go on to win the general election. Congressman La Tourette, you're about to start your own super PAC to promote electable candidates in Republican primaries. Right. Have any problem with that? Because I, well, what do you, first of all, why do you think that's wrong? Well, I, I think the definition of electable is what we're debating here. And you look at who's been winning elections. It's been interesting, exciting, young, energetic people like Ted Cruz, like Marco Rubio. And I think if you applied this, this sort of establishment litmus test, which tends to, to, to be biased for people that are already in office, you're not going to get that new energy. Would we have gotten Pat Toomey? Remember, Karl Rove supported the Arlen Specter as far back as 2004 against Pat Toomey because the logic was Pat Toomey can't possibly win. Arlen Specter later flipped parties when it was convenient for him and became the 60th vote for Obamacare. 
So I think we need to be careful about what it means to be electable. Certainly the Tea Party doesn't bat a thousand, but at least we're winning elections, we're bringing new people into the party, and we're not in a position where the Democrats can jam something through with 60 votes in the Senate because of the Tea Party. See, I, I got to tell you, that there is no litmus test at the Republican Main Street. I, I'm happy to have anybody that labels him or herself as a Republican uh, and wants to represent the entire country. We're not talking about electing the governor of South Carolina, the governor of Texas, the governor of Utah. If we ever want to be a national party, we have to look like America. Today, we look like we're a bunch of guys, white guys, from below the Mason-Dixon line. So how do you look more like America? You, you have to begin to talk about issues in a way that I have to talk about issues. For instance, I never read anything in, in my Republican playbook, and I've been a Republican since the day I was born, that says that Republicans and trade unionists can't get along together, the carpenter, the operating engineer. But s somehow this whole war on prevailing wage has now become a plank of the Republican Party. No, it's not. And the same thing with the environment. I live on Lake Erie. We don't have to be opposed to everything that helps us get clean air and clean water. That's not a Republican test, but, but if you look at the key votes that some of these groups are scoring, and 18 votes was scored by, by Mr. Kibbe's group out of the 1,000 that took place last year, it's not rep. You can make, it's like a poll. You can make it look any way you want to. All right. You got the last word, Mr. Kibbe. I think if you look at the new Republican Party, the party that stands for something, you look at names like Tim Scott and Ted Cruz and Marco Rubio and Raul Labrador and Justin Amash, Mia Love almost got okay. through. This, this is the new future, and it's based on ideas. We don't care about the color of your skin. We're going to have to leave it there, but uh, to be continued, Mr. Kibbe, Congressman LaTourette, thank you both for coming in. We'll stay on top of this debate.